Thanks very much. I'm glad to be back to give the second part of this two-part webinar. The title um, which we decided on initially was what infectious disease providers need to know about addiction treatment. As it turns out, I, I don't think that there are probably many, if any, infectious disease providers in the audience. So despite the title, um, we're going to proceed with some more clinically oriented thing, uh, topics, but it's not really going to be directed at people who provide infectious disease care. It's going to be a more general topic. Um, how it relates to our previous, our previous session um, is that we previously looked at a more global uh, and public health oriented view and reviewed some epidemiologic data about syndemics of HIV, hepatitis, and addiction. Today we're going to look more about what happens in the clinic and some barriers to effective treatment. To review from last time, I defined the term syndemic, and I'll show that slide again, what I mean when I use that term. Uh, we're going to, uh, we previously showed some data in the Great Lakes region specifically, and wherever possible, if I'm going to use data, I'll, I'll use data from this region. And then we talked about some specific roles that healthcare providers can play in addressing syndemics, including uh, screening, linkage to care, co-location of treatment, and care coordination. And we'll, we'll revisit uh, several of these topics this week as well. This is what I mean by the term syndemic, which I know is new for some people. And it's defined as two or more afflictions interacting synergistically, contributing to the excess burden of disease in a population. Endemic theory, individual epidemics are sustained because of harmful social conditions and injurious social connections. I think that the current opioid epidemic, uh, which has driven a dramatic increase in the rate of hepatitis C nationally and the rate of HIV in certain communities, is, is a perfect example of this because of the underlying injurious social conditions and the risk behaviors that people who are, have untreated opioid use disorder uh, tend to engage in. Engage in. But to illustrate how the, the syndemic phenomenon can manifest in an individual patient, I thought I would present a case. So I'm, I'll present it sort of as a, as a standard clinical format, and you'll uh, understand that uh, really what I'm interested in is sort of this the course of the management of this person's illness. So this is a patient who I saw in our HIV clinic in Madison, Wisconsin. He was a 41-year-old man, originally from Milwaukee. And I was evaluating him for management of his HIV infection while he was incarcerated in Dodge Correctional Institution is the central intake facility for people who are in the state prison system. Past history was that he was uh, tested positive for HIV several years earlier, but was never linked to care. He never received antiretroviral therapy. He also had a hepatitis C infection. He had a past history of injection, cocaine, and heroin use. He'd uh, been in and out of the criminal justice system and through that process had been labeled or diagnosed with various mental health conditions ranging from bipolar disorder to stimulant-induced psychosis. He also had hypertension and chronic kidney disease. This uh, sl slide actually doesn't, doesn't project well, but it's, uh, I'm just going to move on to the next one, which shows the same data graphically. So the figure on the bottom is um, the HIV viral load. And assuming um, many in the audience are not familiar with clinical management of HIV, I'll just uh, give the background that the HIV viral load, which is also uh, called the quantitative HIV RNA measurement, is when we take a, a patient's blood and measure how many copies of the virus are present. Someone who is untreated HIV will have a high viral load in the thousands to millions of copies per milliliter. The expectation and the standard um, definition of success in antiretroviral therapy for people with HIV is that there is no detectable virus in the blood. And the, gra the graph with the blue dot shows what this patient's viral load um, uh, numbers had done over the course of the time that I've known him. So closest to the left in 2011, he had an elevated viral load somewhere in the range of uh, 20 to 20 to 30,000, and then shortly after starting antiretroviral therapy, when we saw him in in the prison setting, um, the viral load be came down to undetectable levels, and it stayed there, which is what we expect and what we see in 90% of our patients who remain adherent to medication. So fortunately for Mr. P, he was released from prison in mid 2012. And he followed up and saw me. He moved from Madison to Milwaukee and saw me in clinic. 
And I saw him, and he, sort of, you know, within a few weeks after he was released, which is what we tend to try to do, and he said things were going well. Um, he was trying to find a place to stay. He was still in a temporary living facility or halfway house, was optimistic for the future. Um, and then after that visit, we didn't see him for about an, another few years. And he no-showed for his next several visits. Um, and then I didn't see him until he was reincarcerated uh, about a year and a half later. And what, I, what he filled me in on what I'd missed when I didn't see him is that he'd become homeless, he relapsed with cocaine use, he'd ended his relationship with his partner, and, and therefore had no place to stay. He had a, he had a clinic-based co uh, case manager who was helping him navigate some of the social services available in our county, and he fell out of contact, was back and forth from Milwaukee and Chicago, and um, out of care for HIV. When we saw him back in prison, uh, we checked his HIV viral load, and it was back up uh, with several thousand copies. And uh, this time, unfortunately, when we checked his blood, he had developed resistance to the drugs we were using previously, which can happen if people have intermittent therapy and the virus rebounds from time to time. We started him on a different, a different regimen. He became back, he became uh, undetectable viral load again, um, and then, uh, unfortunately, again, the same thing happened. He was released from prison. It was not consistent with follow-up. And the last we heard, the last two times he showed up for to get his blood drawn, his viral load was elevated. Um, but I haven't seen him uh, for you know, going on two years now. So this is uh, an unfortunate case. It's hard. You know, Mr. P has a, a challenging life with a lot of chaos, um, and I I work with him in sort of this a very na narrow section of his his life and his medical care trying to manage his HIV. But clearly, any way you, any way you slice it, <clears throat> um, the things that my goals for him is in care and management of his disease, we've not been successful. And so he's a good case to think about, well, what are the causes of treatment failure? Medications for HIV are so effective that um, if someone who comes, you know, comes and gets services at our clinic does not have an undetectable viral load, there's usually something pretty major going on that explains what that is. And he had num numerous of these barriers. So the bottom line was he didn't take his medications consistently. The medicines are so effective that if you do, the virus is reliably suppressed. As a consequence of that, he had resistance, and thus he was not on a first-line drug. Um, our first-line regimen, underlying this, I believe he had an untreated mood disorder, he had an untreated substance use disorder, he didn't have social support, he didn't have unstable housing. So all these things contributed to being a real challenge for him to stay engaged in HIV care. And I think this really illustrates well um, the idea of syndemic theory, which is how um, Behavioral factors, which are exemplified in substance use disorders. Structural factors, meaning that he was uh, released to an environment where he had no place to stay um, and didn't have a good uh, access to addiction treatment. And social factors, meaning that he had you know, strained relationships. He was also had, had no income. Um, and was in and out of the criminal justice system. All these things sort of contributed to the fact that this person's HIV is, was not well controlled. And on a large scale, if, these, you know, if there are multiple people like Mr. P in the community, this actually has public health implications because the thing that contributes to the spread of HIV in communities is people whose virus is not suppressed, which is a key feature of our global response to HIV. When we get people on treatment and the virus is suppressed, people don't transmit virus. So theoretically, if we got everyone diagnosed and treated, there would be no transmission of HIV. So this is why on a public, on a public health level, making sure that patients who have challenges like Mr. P get linked to care and get supported in the ways that they need so we can treat the virus is really important. So everyone who's older than a certain age implicitly knows this, but even if they don't think about it. but in the past 20 years, the HIV epidemic in this country has transformed dramatically. And when I say implicitly, it's because what I mean is that you know, in the 80s and 90s, HIV AIDS was front page news. Celebrities were getting sick and dying from AIDS. It was the leading cause of death among people aged 25 to 45 at a period point in the early 90s. Um, and that is quite different than the role of HIV in our public consciousness now. And that is really because of 
effective antiretroviral treatment and the whole system of systems of care which have been developed to make sure that people get linked to care and on treatment. Um, people just don't get sick with HIV AIDS and deaths from AIDS are, are quite rare in this country at this time. But I show this slide to illustrate one thing, um, and this, these data are somewhat old, but it shows how life expectancy increased over this past few decades that I've been talking about. And panel C here, when it talks about what have been the gains in life expectancy for people by transmission group, you see that for um, men who have sex with men, or MSM, they've had the greatest gains in life expectancy, and it's approaching that of the HIV uninfected population. Um, but between 2000 and 2007, there has, hadn't been any gains among people whose trans risk for HIV transmission was injection drug use. So the reason for this, I argue, is all the things that we just talked about that are exemplified in our case and can be fall under this model of syndemic conditions and the injurious social patterns. So with that background, I um, wanted, wanted to go into a, a few main teaching points for today. I have fewer slides than I did in the, in the previous uh, talk, um, and part of that was because we had some interesting questions come in through the chat function at the end of the conversation that we didn't have time to get to. So since I know that many of you are not engaged in HIV treatment, uh, and this may be an opportunity to get some questions answered and have some more of a, a dialogue, even if we can't hear your voice asking questions, I can see all the questions in the, in the chat and we can, um, we can address anything that people have questions about. But anyway, these are the take-home points that I wanted to get to today. There's a, 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 a number of important things that I think all clinicians, whether you treat um, HIV care, if you either treat people for HIV directly or have them in your patient panel, about drug interactions. And these are the so-called pharmacokinetic boosters. Uh, second, I want to revisit the topic that when we manage substance use disorders and HIV, at the same time, they do better for both. And I have some research-oriented data to illustrate that. And then finally, wanted to revisit the topic of care coordination strategies and the important role that they play. So first, to talk about the drug interactions. So fortunately, for, for this context, um, specifically talking about opioid use disorder, although there are medications used for other substance use disorders as well. Um, for the drugs that are our first-line weapons for treating HIV, there are no major drug interactions. Integrase inhibitors and protease inhibitors, our PIs, are the, are the main first-line drugs, and there are no major drug interactions between methadone and buprenorphine. One of the protease inhibitors, which we use without the boosting, which I'll explain again in a moment, um, atazanivir, ATV, does can result in lower levels of the HIV drug, but not has no effect on the level of buprenorphine. And then finally, some of the older drugs that we, we have may reduce the levels of methadone, resulting in withdrawal symptoms. So it is important for people to, who are managing patients methadone realize that some patients on certain HIV regimens might require higher doses of methadone. Although, since this is the time that the, these things were published, um, these have, the, the drugs that have do reduce methadone levels have been supplanted or are not really considered our first-line regimens, although you will still find patients who take these. So this was the, the I think if I was going to teach people one thing about what to know about people who are treated for HIV, it's, uh, it, it is this. And it's that about half of our first-line antiretroviral regimens contain one of two drugs that are considered a pharmacokinetic enhancer. And there aren't many other examples of medicine of how we do this, but in HIV, some, many of the effective antiretroviral drugs are metabolized by the hepatic enzyme cytochrome P450, and we use this feature to our advantage. Um, we syrup, we um, serendipitously realized that one of the drugs, one of the older drugs, ritonavir, is a very potent inhibitor of this enzyme, which, re which um, results in elevated levels of drugs that are metabolized by this pathway. In other words, if you, if you block the way the body breaks down these medicines, you'll have much higher levels of medications in, the, in your blood, which can potentially be related with toxicity. However, we can also use that to our advantage, and it allows us to use lower doses of the medications, which might have side effects, and get high, high levels of active drug in the bloodstream, which is where the action of 
it, if HIV happens as a blood-borne virus. So we've used ritonavir, which is an HIV drug, for that purpose. We've used it in combination with other medications, and we call it boosting. So someone could be on a ritonavir-boosted protease inhibitor-based regimen. That would be that, that's what that means. Um, in 2002, the FDA approved cobicistat, which was developed specifically to block cytochrome P450 when used in conjunction with antiretroviral drugs. This drug has no HIV activity by itself, unlike ritonavir, but is specifically used to, to boost the effect of these other drugs. So why is this important for people to know? Well, there's a lot of other drugs that are metabolized by these enzymes, and I think particularly as the population of people living with age gets older, they accumulate more medical comorbidities, this is going to be something for people, for providers to be aware of. The most um, common example of this causing problems in my experience as a provider is with synthetic glucocorticoids. Uh, fluticasone particularly, which is the, which is the um, uh, inhaled corticosteroid that's used in things like Advair or, or Flonase, um, is metabolized through this pathway and co-administration of cobicistat or ritonavir can re re result in um, excessive levels of these synthetic steroids and actually cause Cushing syndrome. Where this really gets, gets to be a problem is if someone gets an intraarticular or other type of long-acting injectable form, someone gets an injection for rotator cuff, just having the drug injected into the joint space can, and in the presence of these medicines can result in but really high, do high levels of the steroids and can cause adrenal insufficiency and all sorts of problems. We've had people with osteoporosis and, and shock, that, and it's really problematic. So the simple, I think my strategy for making sure that this doesn't happen, number one, is to make sure that patients know that you know, you're on medications that everybody should know has drug, have drug interactions. So if they ever you know, say, don't let anyone give you a, a shot of anything without making sure they know you're on this medication. Um, also, our electronic medical, system, medical records have flags built in, but I think even primary care providers should know that if you have a patient on HIV, this is something you should think about. Um, warfarin is another one. Warfarin needs to be titrated closely for a lot of reasons, but, in, um, but for cobicistat or ritonavir, it can really in interfere with people's uh, anticoagulation. Statins um, need to be dosed at a lower dose because the effect gets boosted, and several others as well, including erectile dysfunction agents instead of hypnotics, which may need to have doses adjusted quite substantially. So when what we've learned from patients who have coexisting HIV and opioid use disorder, um, back to our case, for example, you know, his relapse of drug abuse, and he used both co cocaine or st stimulants and opioids was a real impediment for him being adherent and consistently on his, um, on his antiretrovirals. Uh, there's a numerous studies that show if we address both of these things concurrently uh, with opioid agonist therapy or, or MAT, medication-assisted treatment, that it improves outcomes for HIV. And that includes uh, reduced opioid use, improved mental life, mental health, reduce criminal behavior, incarceration, decrease hospitalizations, and specifically it leads to better adherence and better viral suppression among people with HIV. And there was a uh, study um, called the Beehives study, uh, which looked in 10 settings and they intentionally implemented a strategy to co-administer um, buprenorphine naloxone or, um, with in the same clinical settings where people received treatment for their, for their HIV. Um, and in this study, which was relatively small, it seemed to work pretty well. Um, the lessons they learned was that it succeeded best if there was a coordinator, which they said sort of the glue, um, and in many cases this was a nurse or a counselor or a health educator or a peer or, or a pharmacist. These are the, the data from those study, which kind of can illustrate how there were substantial differences. So the gray bars are people that were um, maintained on buprenorphine naloxone for three or more quarters out of the, out of the study. So the people who were highly adherent or, or maintained uh, adherence to the buprenorphine naloxone. And then the orange are people who did not stay on it for the 
for the, the majority of the study. And on the left, this is the percentage of people who are an, on antiretroviral therapy. Very low levels in the orange means the people who did not get their opioid use disorder managed concurrently, and the gray bars were uh, the people who were. The, the response is not great in either like I in either setting. On the right, you see the the, great, the the bars are the number who had an undetectable viral load. And what I said at the beginning is that we expect all of our patients to have, to have an undetectable viral load. And when you look at our clinic, for example, at any time, upwards of 90% of our patients have an undetectable viral load. So the fact that in this study, the best they got was 50, 60% when they treated with uh, with opioid treatment. Um, clearly better than the 15 to 20 percent of people who did not have their, their opioid use disorder treated, but still not as good as what we consider to be the standard measure of success in HIV care. So the, cha the challenges were, were that uh, they learned that this co-location of services works better when there's multiple, multiple prescribers. And this is something I've learned firsthand as well. In, here in Madison, I work at a, a larger university-based clinic, and then one day a week I work at a small community-based clinic where I see patients with HIV. And we've started treating uh, patients with uh, buprenorphine naloxone who have opioid use disorder in, in that clinic. And it's been, a, it's been a challenge to implement. First of all, I was, you know, I'm, I am new to this. Uh, I was, just became a buprenorphine prescriber in the past year, so this was the first time I had started this. But at the same time, we also had to make sure our nurse was, was on board, our pharmacist, um, make sure we had the appropriate protocols. And for a, for a small clinic with one prescriber who has buprenorphine waiver, it, it was a bit of a challenge. Um, so you can see when there's some institutional knowledge and people who can cross cover and fill prescriptions and other people know about it, it, it can be uh, easier to scale up. There were challenges of, of culture between addiction and HIV practices, and I, I uh, have to ask uh, Rick Altice exactly what, what he meant by this because this was, this was his study. But I think, but I think the, the sense was just that the two, the two angles are sort of accustomed to doing things a different way. In HIV, we don't check, in HIV clinic practice, we don't tend to check urine drug toxicology screens for, for any other reason, and so this was a new piece that we had to, we had to bring in. And then polysubstance use and mental illness comorbidities created additional challenges. So we found that in my, you know, the example that I presented in the case who had a cocaine use disorder and untreated mood disorder, you know, he was not doing well in care. Um, other patients anecdotally who have stimulant use disorder or, or otherwise disorganized, not highly motivated, uh, don't do as well. And I'm sure this, this people in this audience are, are aware of this. So, um, so we can reach, if, if this is a good service to have to be able to provide MAT and HIV care settings, but I don't think it's a fix for everything. I think there's um, patients that have challenges. And, and the, the, the idea that some very flexible, very patient-centered care coordination through case management or patient navigators makes a big difference. Um, and to highlight that fact, I wanted to uh, I mentioned this during our last uh, last webinar, um, so I want to highlight it again or introduce it again for people who are who are new. Um, but here in Wisconsin, uh, we were part of a consortium for uh, of six other states to to really try to implement this on a larger scale. Um, the Wisconsin project embedded patient navigators in HIV clinics for the purpose of supporting and preventing disengagement for care for people who had who had high risk for whatever reason, not just substance abuse, not just criminal justice disorder, um, but the idea that you know if 80 to 90 percent of people um, find HIV care relatively easy and have an undetectable viral load um, without a lot of extra support, what do we need to do to fill the gap for the remaining 10, 20 percent of people? What are the services that they need to help them be successful um, and have the virus suppressed? The solution that was fostered and developed and scaled by scaled up by this initiative um, was that of patient navigators, which can also be called intensive case managers um, or peer coaches, I've heard it described. So we um, implemented this as coordinated at the state health department for a, a number of clinics across the state. And specifically, and this was a, a, some data I wanted to share, we offered this to patients in HIV, in our HIV clinic, who were in the Wisconsin prison system and then planned to, to move in Madison or Milwaukee after release. So just like Mr. P from our, from our case, um, we've learned this lesson over and over again, that getting released from prison or, or 
coming in and out of jail is one of the biggest signals or the biggest red flags that someone is going to have trouble adhering to their HIV medication. So we specifically tried to direct an intervention against, against that, for that group. Um, we've been evaluating this qualitatively and quantitatively. There's been a couple publications that really show um, on the, from the qualitative analysis of, of the value that patients have felt. Um, and these are some of the some of the quotes: is that this patient navigator makes me feel like I'm not alone. And the the purpose of this analysis was to really highlight the social support that people get and, and the benefit of that. Other it was described as you know fostering a feeling of worth through these linkage to care specialists, which was the other name for the patient navigators. And um, most uh, and through the evaluation, there were uh, a few main barriers to care which were specifically targeted by this intensive case management, um, that being social isolation, low health literacy, low motivation, failed linkages to needed services like addiction treatment, and then a lack of a personal relationship with providers. This quote I shared last time, but I, I think it sums up so well, so I was going to repeat it, and that was that um, the patient said, when I first got out of prison, I was so institutionalized, I wasn't ready for the world. And to try to put it in words, I was almost shell-shocked, like the world was too busy and too fast for me to keep up. I couldn't even navigate the city buses. That's how crazy incarceration is, what it does to the mind. So the linkage care specialist being there to help me and tell me little things like that meant a lot. I, I really needed that. I think it's an overlooked risk factor for people getting out of prison that life goes on while they're not there. And some people who have been in for four or five years, we, especially with, with technology and communications and Internet and things, uh, I think there's a um, we can we can uh, neglect to pay attention to how much things have changed while people have been incarcerated. Not, you know, nothing to say of the sort of the mental health effects has of being isolated from people's family has uh, um, by itself in, in uh, incarcerated populations. So this this is a new a new figure I didn't share last time, which shows our the analysis, and we just we just uh, submitted this for publication, it, and this is showing. Um, of people that participated in the linkage to care program when they were released from prison compared to people who did not get participated in the linkage to care program um, you know, in red. And this, this is a, called a survival curve, but it essentially shows um, how likely are people, how, what is, how long is the delay before people get linked to care, meaning they show up and, and get evaluated and see a provider for HIV. And uh, the blue line are people who were not served by the program. They, you know, they stayed unlinked to care for a much longer period of time, where the red bar shows that people um, got linked to care quickly, and overall, mo the majority of them, 80% 80, 80 were linked to care within, within the six months for a prison. So a, a significant difference, which is, gives us a, a clue that this is fulfilling an, an unmet need. So that's one example of um, what is called care coordination. And, and here in Wisconsin, and I know elsewhere, you know, we realize that this is not specific to, to HIV. People living with HIV tend to have a lot of psychosocial challenges that benefit from this type of care coordination, but so really do many, if, if not most, people who have substance use disorders. And so in addiction treatment itself, there, there's a movement in, in many areas to use re, you know, recovery coaches or patient navigators to make sure that people access services and just check in on people. Um, and the, the available data say that they work pretty well for meeting, treat, meeting treatment goals. Um, they're not cheap, though, and we're finding hard, you know, wanting to start a program and sustain a program is not easy. It, it really uh, takes a lot of resources for training. Um, these are usually full-time staff that have a limited number of caseloads because you can't provide really intensive case management to a large number of people. Um, and so my interest as a researcher is to really try to measure the, the impact or the benefit that this can have and make, make the case that, you know, this is this is cost effectiveness or cost savings. If we get people in care, we keep people out of prison, we keep people from relapsing and overdosing. That it, there's a, there's a, a lot of gain, health gains to be made for the investment, and so that's sort of an area that we're we're working on, trying to build the database for that. Okay, so during the question and answer last last time, uh, there was one thing, and I. I uh, was challenged by because I didn't know the answer, so I, I did a little research and I just wanted to get back to it. But someone, someone asked um, because I, sh I shared some recommendations from SAMHSA that that screening for transmission risk behaviors 
for HIV and HIV itself is recommended in opiate treatment settings. I think the question was something to the effect that, well, is there an easy-to-use tool that we could or should use? And I'm familiar with a lot of a lot of questionnaire items that are used for research purposes, but but I had to admit that I really wasn't familiar with things that are are easy to deploy in practice. So I did I did a little digging and the federal guidelines for opiate treatment programs were not very helpful. You know, they, they say that consistent with resources, opioid treatment programs should screen and test for hepatitis C and, and hepatitis B directly, and they should receive education and teach patients, um, so on and so forth. Um, it gives you a few little teaching points that hep C is four times as prevalent as HIV, that you don't have to look sick. Um, but it doesn't really tell you how to, how to do it. Um, it doesn't really answer the question. Um, this was the this was the guideline uh, statement that we that we reviewed last time, and that that's translated to not a lot of treatment facilities actually doing it. So, you know, this was a survey that showed only only low low 20 of in terms of substance abuse treatment programs, mental health services or mental health and substance abuse treatment services were doing any kind of screening for hepatitis C, um, and that. In general healthcare settings, it was better. But I think the the ideal that people who are engaged in addiction treatment who may not be, receive general preventive health care, you know, this might be an underutilized venue for screening. Um, I agree with that. I think it is useful, but it seems to not be easy. Um, and the evidence here is that it's just it's not done in, in routinely in most settings. So, sorry, I think I just did something to the formatting. There we go. So I looked into the scientific literature and said, well, what what is there? And I, I did find um, some uh, example of some researchers who used um, survey data about risk behaviors and created a, a score. And uh, you can't doesn't project well that printing is long. But I, I wanted to share this just to make the point that it it has been done. These are the questions. You know, how old are you? Are you in methadone maintenance? How often did you inject? Did you inject cocaine? Did you share a cooker? Did you share needles? Did you visit a shooting gallery? And that was the term that, that was used in this study in, in Baltimore for usually an abandoned house where there's multiple people shooting um, or injecting drugs together. And then they used um, somewhat complicated statistical models to create a priority score. And you have, for example, if they're less than 30, you give them 38, and then it's 30, you add 31. So there's some math involved here. And that's probably not the most usable um, just checklist, and you, ha and you have to do a total score. It's nice to do these t sort of exercises because it, uh, it is, it's numeric and it's rigorous, and it gives you some insight into what are the, the factors that contribute the most. But when you're having to do do math and add things across it, I don't think it's quite as quite as usable. So the other thing uh, yeah, I, I found um, is uh, um, this is done in Minnesota. And Wisconsin has something similar that it, it tags onto its hepatitis C rapid testing form. Is just at, just asking the questions. Um, have and this is what I think the, the sort of the bare bones of what people need to know. Have you ever injected drugs? When was the last time you were tested for HIV, hepatitis C, and, hep and hepatitis B? And if you haven't been or haven't been in the past year, then that's all you need to know. Someone should get screened. If they're um, the risk reduction question, if they are actively injecting or if they're infected, you ask them if they share needles or other injection equipment. Um, and you, these are really the core things you need to know. They're a great way to start the conversation. and. Um, and are not that complicated, and you don't need to know. It's really a qualitative measure. Yes, this person's at risk, and then the question is, has this person been screened appropriately? And if not, is there, how, what do we do about this? So, so this is um, my last slide, which uh, just summarizes this. And I, I think that the, the takeaway for how do you um, how do we address this? HIV and hepatitis C risk in addiction treatment settings um, is that we should doing something compared to nothing is is a, is going to be a huge step. Just having that conversation with somebody about their risk reduction and meeting people where they're at about um, how at risk they are and whether they've been screened shows that you care about clients as a person. And that conversation can um, translate into into a referral to some treatment if we can't do treatment on site, or it might not. And if it doesn't, you know, we we know from other other areas of medicine like smoking cessation is 
hearing the same prevention message over and over and over has a cumulative effect that even if someone doesn't act on it today, you're planting a seed um, and you're putting it on their radar screen and allowing them to, to you know, giving them information. The other thing is that um, there's been a movement away toward doing formalized and sort of highly protocolized pre- and post-test counseling. It's not to say that counseling in the setting of HIV and hepatitis C tests is not valuable or important, but if we worry too much about doing it and doing it the right way, it might actually result in fewer people getting tested. So um, CDC has, has recommended, and I agree with this, that the most important thing is that we just get the test, get, pe get people to know their zero status, get them linked to services if needed. Um, don't worry about written, written, written consent or counseling insofar that it might make people less likely to get tested. So, so that's, that's um, the stuff I wanted to cover today. I have uh, more time to uh, have any discussion. Um, I'll see. I'll I see some comments in the end. I guess do, do you want me to go through these, or does Maureen or Cindy want to kind of moderate this, or what do you think? Hi, Dr. Westergaard. Thank you. I've been pulling questions as they've come through while you were talking, and I can toss them your way right now if you're ready. Sure. Well, the first question that came up is. Uh, what is the population where you see the greatest increase in HIV recently, and why? Sure. Among the population that I think we're more reaching through ATTC, so through the, the population with substance use disorders, um, there has been increase in HIV in certain communities, and that's not clear whether the certain communities are unique or we're just detecting it there more quickly, um, but in communities where uh, there are few prevention resources, which tend to be rural communities, um, there have been a, a number of isolated HIV outbreaks. The, the, the most notable of these, which we presented kind of as a case study in, the, in part one of the webinar, was in Scott County, Indiana. And what we learned from that is it was people who were injecting multiple times a day, who were injecting together with a lot of different people, and were in an area where testing resources and needle exchange were not available. Those were sort of the, that was sort of the perfect storm for HIV to become introduced and spread in a community of people who are injecting drugs. Um, we've seen similar signals in um, New England and possibly in West Virginia as well. Um, which are both both uh, areas that are somewhat more remote, don't have the same access to harm reduction, by which I mean syringe service programs and and testing service, so people can get linked to care promptly. So those are the so those are the areas that are among people who inject drugs where HIV is is on the rise. Overall, however, across the U.S., the HIV epidemic is still predominantly driven by people with, who are acquiring it through sexual contact, and it tends to be highest in young men who have sex with men, um, particularly non-white men who have sex with men. So his, Hispanic, Latino, and African-American men who have sex with men still have the highest risk of HIV in the country. And unfortunately, those, you know, for, the, for the past five to 10 years, those, those rates have remained elevated, um, even though the overall incidence of HIV has gone down transmission is still happening in those, those smaller communities. Thanks, Dr. Westergaard. Our next question is from someone who asks, are you, how worried are you with combination of statin and cobistatin, I think, with the potential for rhabdomyolysis and metabolic syndrome? And that I'm yeah. not sure I pronounced those correctly. Yep. Yeah. No, I, I I know. So 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 rhabdomyolysis is a potential consequence of being on statins, particularly at, at high doses. Um, and I mentioned that there's an interaction with cobicistat, which is this pharmacokinetic enhancer, and statin is one of the medications. So it's uh, we're not too concerned because we know with there, there are some statins which are worse. So um, lovastatin tends to be the worst. That one's not used that much. Some of the newer generation ones, atorvastatin and rosuvastatin, um, have less of an interaction. 
and the interaction is somewhat more predictable. So we can reduce the dose by half and feel like we give it relatively safely. So we monitor a little bit more closely. But I think the take home or the answer is that it's not an absolute contraindication. Um, and, be, and because it's, their interaction is predictable, we can adjust the dose and get, our, and get around it. Thank you. Oh, here's a question about um, screening for sexual behaviors that are correlated with HIV, HDV infection, and opioid addiction. Uh, in your, I think that asking about your research projects, Dr. Westergaard, do you screen yeah. for those behaviors? Yeah. In in our research, yes, it's a it's sort of a standard um, piece of our risk behavior inventory that we do, um, and it is uh, like I said, there's a there's a hierarchy of risky sexual behavior. Unprotected anal intercourse is certainly the highest. So to read to accurately gauge someone's risk, we have to um, has the details and somewhat somewhat detailed, and it takes some practice to feel comfortable doing it in a way. It's uncomfortable for everybody, but I've learned that the the the, the more you do it, the the easier it gets. And doing it in a structured way, like through a, a questionnaire, is, is helpful as well. Um, but I think particularly, but uh, potentially unique, um, or at least particularly important in the. Uh, addiction treatment population is that one of the biggest risk factors for HIV in the Scott County outbreak, and we're we're picking some of this up in our Wisconsin rural uh, community study as well, is uh, exchange sex. So particularly among women who have um, traded sex for drugs, that was uh, the mechanism by which uh, a lot of HIV transmission happened in um, in Indiana, and we're seeing that as a, a, an identified risk factor in our Wisconsin study, although we have not uh, detected a large number of HIV cases to date, but it's a, it's a concern. So I think sexual risk, sc sexual risk screening among injection drug users is still very important. I wouldn't just focus on this clean, the, the clean um, needle use and needle sharing. In fact, in the cases where people who inject drug use People who inject drugs are diagnosed with HIV. Uh, very frequently, it's, it, it, upon closer investigation, it's probably a sexual um, behavior that was the ultimate you know, transmission risk. So, so it's an important question. I'm glad you asked it. Thank you. Let's see. Our next question, or uh, some information. In California, we have to provide communicable diseases, STDs, hepsi Hep C and B screening, especially in residential treatment. I've not run across any positives. They are low risk. My question is, if a positive HIV appears, do they qualify for higher level of care, or do we use parallel treatment? So I, I, I guess to clarify, I know we can't, we can't uh, uh, have back and forth quite, quite easily, but um, for a higher, a higher level of Care meaning for addiction care, I, I guess is the is what I'm not certain about. So, I have HIV. Um, if someone is positive, they certainly qualify for um, prompt linkage to specialized care, which I if that would be considered a higher level. I would think that the goal is when the, the time that someone has a positive to get them to see, a, you know, um, an HIV care specialist. Uh, you know, Ideally, a medical provider, but at least a you know a case case manager, nurse to to kind of help them process and, and understand what needs to be done, you know as soon as possible, you know in our in, in the same day in a lot of you know is, is the gold standard in a lot of areas if there's testing if it's an agency that does both testing and treatment, um, but I think if if the question is is getting to do, does their addiction treatment need to change I would I, I think it's very it's it's very dependent on the patient you know patients who are you know, stable on methadone or an outpatient treatment um, can continue to be successful when they have HIV and, and need different kinds of care for that. And we've seen all models. We, we have some patients who, who get their addiction treatment services right at our clinic and others that are, are active in a community-based provider. And, and, and I think either, either can work. But I guess the, I guess the take-home, I would say, in response to that was, um, if there is a if HIV testing is going to be done in an addiction treatment setting, 
before getting started with this, we just need to make sure that we have a referral, a referral network and a way to promptly link people to care, because that's something that in the HIV community we've worked really hard to emphasize is that you know, testing is important. Mm -hmm. Linkage to care for people who are positive is critical um, because a lot of people, when they're tested, if we don't actively facilitate them getting into care, will will disappear and just sort of you know fly under the radar for a few years um, and hopefully come back before they get sick. But that's what we want to try to avoid. We want to get people started on treatment as, as soon as possible to prevent further transmission and pr protect their immune system. Thanks. Thanks, Dr. Westergaard. And a uh, question related that maybe you already answered uh, fully is what protocol should be followed in regard to HIV positive cl um, clients engaged in treatment services? Yeah, yeah, that's what I was just kind of to address. I think, you know, an yeah. idealized version of what it could look like or try to implement here, <clears throat> um, it, actually that I mentioned the, the HRSA, the grant with the linkage to care specialists or patient navigators. So after the, Earth, after the HRSA grant was over, our, our organization uh, found funds to continue to have that person on staff because we found it so valuable. So around you know, UW Health, which is our, you know, our healthcare organization, whether it be in, in a primary care setting or emergency department, if, if someone is uh, test positive, we're trying to get the word out that we have somebody whose job it is to meet people where they're at and help, get the, help them get linked to care. So um, our linkage to care specialist is sort of on call. This works because we have, this, we have funding for this position and because in Wisconsin we're a relatively low incidence area, so it doesn't happen that often. Um, so we, when people people sh uh, show up who needing linkage to care, we can get them in promptly and we have someone who's sort of specifically trained in, in meeting people and getting them linked to care. So that kind of resource might not be available everywhere, but I think most, most jurisdictions, most health, most health departments, if you engage with them and, and ask what are the resources to help people get linked to care, there, there should be some analogous option, even if it's not as quick, but um, in larger cities, there's um, Wisconsin call them disease intervention uh, specialists, so people do contact tracing and linkage to care. Um, you know, so any Ryan White Care Act funded program should have uh, case managers who can reach out. So I think the, the, uh, that linkage to care piece I'll just emphasize is really important. Um, if it's a, uh, a rapid test, a rapid point of care test like it's done in a lot of, uh, a lot of um, community based settings, the other part of the protocol is that most people need confirmatory testing. So we don't have time to go into all the mechanics of what HIV testing is, but usually there's some part of the um, protocol where if, if, if they didn't get a blood draw for, for multiple reasons, they sometimes need to get another specimen obtained for a confirmatory testing because the rapid tests that get done in community basements or non-clinic settings need to be confirmed with a secondary method before saying with certainty that someone has HIV. So those are those are all all aspects um, that are you know that are important considerations. Thanks, Dr. Westergaard. Now we have a question about working with young people. What suggestions do you have for our youth to young adult population from the ages 16 to 25 who have been affected with multiple STDs or have HIV virus, who choose to not remain consistent with taking their medications? not to mention practicing, not practicing safe sex. My Kansas City, Missouri jurisdiction suffers deeply with our young population being infected with HIV, not to mention AIDS. It's extremely devastating to witness yeah. that. I, I agree, that is, that is sort of the hardest, the hardest, most challenging frontier in the, you know, the fight against HIV is I think adolescents and young adults who, um, who aren't, who, uh, aren't engaged in prevention the way that you know we, we hope that they would be, and um, it's a it is an area of active research. There's a a lot of um, kind of innovative things of trying to trying to engage populations in in social media campaigns and online communities that that use you know youth you know, targeted messages. I don't know how how successful they are. 
um, the fact that the, the leading edge of the HIV epidemic in terms of new infections is in this community that you just described is really, I think, evidence of the fact that this is really challenging. Um, an, an interesting area of research um, that people can know about is, is PrEP or pre-exposure prophylaxis, yeah. which is daily medication that people who are at high risk for HIV can uh, take on a daily basis, and it blocks the, the virus if someone is exposed to it. It's highly effective when taken as directed, but the adolescent mindset that's sort of not very future focused and not adhered, like I think contributes to some of, some of this increased risk, may not be the most likely to want to adhere to daily medications to prevent HIV as well. There's some interesting uh, research in the future about using long-term injectable medications for PrEP, for pre-exposure prophylaxis, which I think will be coming in the next year or two. Um, this is interesting because it's, you know, it's, I guess it would be similar to you know, uh, dep depot preparations for, for contraception. Is you can use, we'll have depot concentrations of antiretrovirals that can block against uh, HIV infection. And for people that are not adherent, that could be one way to protect them, at least against HIV. But treating people who are at high behavioral risk and not interested in risk reduction is, is, is definitely a challenge. Um, but I think what, you know, the, the paradigm for, for working with people who inject drugs and take risks that I think is most valuable and could have some lessons for teaching people who are engaged in kind of high sexual risk-taking behaviors is just is engaging with services that are non, non-judgmental and meeting people where they're at and, and sort of earnestly having conversations that you know, you're your own person and I'm telling you what to do, but this is how to keep yourself safe and uh, being consistent in those messages, I, I think is the best way to engage that, that population. Can't make people do something they don't want to do, but when we are sort of judgmental and people feel fear that they're being judged or stigmatized, then we have no access to the population at all because they don't want to have anything to do with us. So, so I, I think the or organizations that have success in delivering prevention services are ones that kind of acknowledge that people are going to people are going to make their decisions, and our role is to support them and help them keep safe to the extent that they want our help and have an opening in non-stigmatizing environment, and that, that tends to be the best way to, to, to have services available and used is to have a sort of a relationship with a trust, you know, trusting relationship with a community and a service organization, but definitely it's not, it's not, not easy. Thanks, Dr. Westergaard. Let's see if we have any other questions coming in. Um, but while we're waiting, uh, would you like to comment on World Hepatitis Day coming up on July 28th? And any, is there anything you'd like to add about the theme of this year's event, Find the Missing Millions? It's, it's very timely, and it's, it's very um, it's a, it's nice that this is coming up this, this month. I think it's a good opportunity to have conversations. And by the way, it's, it's World Hepatitis Day. What does that mean for, what does that mean for us? Um, the, the, the missing millions that is, refers to the fact that I still think that of the millions of, you know, the, the millions of people who are infected with hepatitis C in this country, about 50% still don't know that they're infected. So that's the, that, that's really why the, the push toward testing for hepatitis C in all types of non-conventional settings outside of healthcare um, is so important. Um, the other reason that goes along with that, where I think it really resonates with the addiction treatment community is that the individuals that are highest risk for hepatitis C are young people who are injecting drugs and, and uh, not, inject, you know, not injecting in a safe way, um, is that what we've learned in our research is they are not likely to be using routine preventive care and are not likely to get tested by a primary care provider. So other reasons to, you know, uh, other reasons to, to, to think about the role of addiction treatment providers is that, you know, the population, which is otherwise young and healthy but engaged in transmission risk behaviors, are you know, need to get reached some other way because they're they're not just showing up and have a family doctor who's going to take care of all this stuff. So, so I think it's great. It's uh, World Hepatitis Day is is useful because it's a little more excuse to you know get get the word out and and put up signs and um, it's definitely needed because we're at a, a point in history where is this kind of 
it's unfortunate because right now we have tools, we have better treatment for hepatitis C than we ever have. We can cure 90, 99% of people relatively easily with a you know, several month course of treatment. Um, but unfortunately, at the same time, transmission is going up, which is, and it's driven to the large degree by how much the opioid injection epidemic has gotten higher. So we're we're uh, it's we're we're losing the battle, unfortunately. Um, and I think to to win to turn the tide to win the battle, we need to really focus on that that whole cascade of getting people tested, linked to care, and then treatment. And there's a lot of challenges to get there, but we, we sort of know the recipe because we've made such progress with HIV, so we kind of need to adopt that model. Otherwise, otherwise hep hepatitis C is going to, you know, we're going to have the, the majority of, of people who inject drugs in this country infected, and it's going to be very expensive to treat down the road. Thanks, Dr. Westergaard, um, and thanks for the information about World Hepatitis Day. We've got a link to the World Hepatitis Alliance up on the screen, and they've got great resources, not just for World Hepatitis Day, but for, for us to use all year round. The ATC, ATTC network also has a project dedicated to uh, viral hepatitis called HCV Current. We encourage everyone to go to the ATTC page and look at that. It's got resources for professionals to use. Looking for more questions coming in as we have a few more minutes. I see some of our participants are typing. We've had a lot of people asking about uh, the recording of your first webinar, Dr. Westergaard. And I want to let everyone know that that has been posted on the Great Lakes ATTC website under our recorded webinars page. So it's available for viewing at any time. Your PowerPoints are also posted there for people to access. And we'll do the same for this webinar. We're getting a lot of thank yous. I think people are, as we're approaching the top of the hour, uh, so we'll be signing off now, and we want to thank everyone for joining us today. Okay, Thanks, thank everyone. You. Thank you, Dr. Westergaard. You're very welcome. Ditto. Thank you very much, Dr.